thanks for uh, doing the podcast. Great to be here. Yeah, it's nice to see you again. Um, we have uh, we've crossed paths a couple times over the years. I went to college with your lovely wife. Yes, and I think um, I think I said this to you in an email, but Amy, um, I have this. It's weird how memory is bizarrely selective, but I have this very vivid memory of being in a class with her freshman year. And there was an assignment to do something creative. And I made this photo exhibit. I went downtown into San Francisco and photographed all these homeless people. And I blew up these photographs and mounted them. And it was really the first thing, the first time I'd ever done anything like creative. Like I was always very much like a bookish person. And I just remember her being so kind and and considerate, like she had all these nice things to say about it. And, and, and it stuck out. I think it still is in my memory because it was really the first time that anybody had, had like put wind in my sails for anything creative that I've done. And it's always stayed with me. It's bizarre. Well, I had a similar conversation with a, one of my first writing teachers in college recently. And because I had, I have like a, a, a you know, there's not one specific memory except for the fact that I was in a creative writing class in college at a little school in upstate New York. Uh-huh. And I was like trying to do this thing and writing like bad short stories. And I'm sure he knew they were bad, but he he was nice enough to be like, you know, these aren't all bad. There's something kind of good here. Uh-huh. And he said it in such a way that it was sort of like he was giving me permission to pursue something that I really liked and gave me pleasure. And I think, and that really like stuck out well, in my got, mind. There's like an ant there's on the mic or something. A spider, spider. Uh-oh, flick but it. we love spiders because they get rid of the mosquitoes. <laughs> so we do not. That's a first what? for the podcast. So a spider, a spider on the crawling mic? on the microphone. Yeah. Well, they know, they probably know that that I'm a huge Charlotte's Web right. fan. So they know that they're in safe hands around right, me. So you won't get bit. Right. But uh, the but that idea that someone like gives you permission to do the thing right. that you really like, I think that's that really stays with you. And it's important. And I think as you go through life and as you sort of mature in your career, if you pass that on to a younger person who you see sort of fighting with something and trying to do something and just trying to, and working really hard at it, I think it's a really like valuable thing that you can do. And they're really small gestures that to the person giving it might not seem like anything, but can make all the difference in a young person's life. And people come back to you like years later and they say like, I remember when you said to me, and you'll you'll have have no, no yeah, yeah. I'm sure Amy has no recollection of saying that You could have no recollection of this, but you know, Things stick with you yeah. um, that when they sound right and when you want to hear them, there's sort of these, these yeah. moments. So. We should probably point out, I mean, Amy, you know, is this uber successful uh, publishing executive. She yeah, she's done pretty imprint. well. Like Amy It's, Einhorn. it's yes, really uh, amazing what she's created. And mm-hmm. I, I remember her as being like really smart and intellectual and savvy. She had this like, like New York cool about her kind of intellectual girl from prowess. New Jersey. Yeah. You're telling her she had New York cool, but it was, a, but it she's going to love that. Like sophisticated, you know what I mean? And, and so it's no surprise to me what she's been able to create and do. And I, I guess she's probably most well known for discovering uh, big little lies and the help, right? Like she published both of those. Yeah. Books. Those are two big ones on the fiction side. Last year she did Jim Comey's book, wow. um, which was uh, an experience. Yeah. I will say that. And, and she, was, like and, she created her own imprint at a very young age, right? Which was like highly unusual. Thing. Uh, yes. It, it was, it, there was a time when, you know, there's, there's certain directions you can go in the publishing business mm-hmm. and, that was one thing she wanted to try. And uh, I believe it was Putnam was the company that sort of gave her own imprint. So yeah, on the spine of many books, it says Amy Einhorn Books. That's which crazy. Is pretty cool. Yeah, she since has moved to another She's company. Flat where, yeah, now, right? Flatiron yeah. Books now. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, has done a lot of great stuff there. Uh, so does so, she, do you go to her to review your work? Like absolutely. how does that work? Like you know, being, it, it, <laughs> being married to somebody who's an, who's an editor. It's great. Well, it's great for me. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, I mean, she's not the publisher of my books, obviously. Right. But you know, every, it's funny. A lot of people ask me 
and they ask it in the context of, oh, that must be really hard, you know, sharing your writing with her and her going over that. And I mean, in, I've written two books now, both times did the exact same thing, which is before I turned in the manuscript, you know, like she got the first draft uh-huh. and, you know, tore it apart right. in her way. And people said, oh, is that really difficult? And my reaction was, well, why would it be difficult? Like, here's the person who loves you and wants nothing but what's best for you. Yeah. And she's actually really good at this thing. She gets paid to do it. And here she is like, I mean, who else's hands would you rather yeah, be in of course. in that situation? So you just sort of go, I mean, you go and you let yourself be vulnerable. You know, that's okay. Like you need help. Like yeah. we all need help. This is a, you know, both running and writing people see as very sort of solitary activities, but they're both, I think, can be very collaborative arts. And at least when they're done well, uh, it takes a team. And um, having your wife on your team, helping you along the way and saying, you totally lost me right. during these 20 pages. I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, that's something you right. should take to heart and yeah. maybe say, okay, why? Well, here's what I was trying to get out there. And she said, well, you didn't, you know, well, you failed in that spot. It didn't, it <laughs> yeah. didn't work. And she's uh, like, okay, great. Let's try it again. Yeah. Um, you just have to have a healthy ego and, you know, check yourself a little bit, I would imagine. But nobody's going to put the amount of care into it, you know, than her. Like, there's this idea that, that when you publish a book, you're going to be having these midnight three hour conversations with your editor over philosophy and life. And <laughs> it, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, I don't know what your relationship was or has been with your editor of this book, but um, editors are busy. And with the consolidation of all these publishing companies, they're like project managers. They're handling so many books. And no matter how much they care about your book, they're they're distracted by all the other things they have to do. Yeah, you're one of a you're one of a bunch of authors, uh-huh. uh, and you're one of a bunch of books that's being published. And um, you know, I think it's always been that way, where you know people turn to each, turn to other writers and say, mm-hmm. you know, can you look at this for me? Does this make sense? Does this work? And and then once it's sort of ready to go out the door, you feel like it's in a it's in a it's in the kind of shape to go out the door, then you let it go out the door. I mean, I know Amy would never have let me put a manuscript out into the world if it just wasn't up to the right standards, if it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. And I mean, I'm pretty hard on myself too. I have this massive fear of boring readers. Uh Uh, it's, It's a big ask, I think these days with so many distractions to get people to you know, read your thousand word stories, much less read your hundred thousand word book. So you, know, you got to put every effort into keeping the story moving, keeping it going, keeping them turning pages. And I, I feel like I'm a pretty good judge of my own work at this point on when I'm falling short. I don't know if I'm mm. my biggest critic, but I'm up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had uh, Kelly Corrigan in here yesterday, who's written a slew of New York Times bestsellers. And she said something almost exactly the same, what you said. Like, if you're going to ask people to read your book, like, you better have shown up for uh, the page 110%, because it is a big ask in this distracted age to ask somebody to sit down and, and spend that kind of quiet, undistracted time with something that you poured your heart and soul into. It, it, takes, a, it takes a while. I'm kind of a slow reader, so it takes me a while yeah. to read books. And I, it's just, it's hard to get people's attention yeah. at these days. Well, you did a great job. I love the book. It's definitely not boring. It's a page turner. That's good. Um, I'm not done with it yet, but I'm well into it and I really enjoyed it. Um, And that's what we're here to talk about today. We're going to talk about running. We're going to talk about this book. Uh, And I'm interested, maybe the the launching point is just to ask you, like, why, like, first of all, why, what drew you to writing a book about running to begin with? And how and why did you laser in on this character, Bob Larson, as a protagonist to tell the story you wanted to tell? Well, I'll deal with the first question, which is, 
what drew me to want to write about this. And that's really, I think the question that's been sort of battering my head the last, I don't know, five, 10 years or something like that. I mean, I've been a runner for, let me do the math, I don't know, 35 years or something uh-huh. like that. But um, the question that I've sort of been going back and forth is I've always wanted to get at the idea of, you know, why do we run? And what, of all the activities we could do, why do we still do this thing? We haven't had to run for our food for a long time now mm-hmm. um, since we became an agricultural culture. And yet we still do it. And people have sort of never stopped doing it. Obviously they do it in much larger numbers now and wear fancy clothes when they're doing it and fancy shoes. But what's going on with us uh when we go spend three miles or five miles or eight miles or 250 miles running at a time. What are we running to? What are we running from? Uh, Runners spend a lot of time alone uh, often and um, we have a lot of time to think. And I think that's one of the reasons why running sort of lends itself to some pretty good writing Mm -hmm. at times. And so... uh, there was, I always wanted to write a running book about some of these things. Um, but I didn't, I didn't really want to write it about myself. Uh, I didn't think there was anything particularly outstanding about my life as a runner. I mean, it's outstanding to me, uh, but I didn't know how to, I, I didn't think my, I, as how to an, wed I, your own personal yeah, I didn't think, I didn't think narrative. I could. You know, my I didn't think I could carry a whole book and uh-huh. like my ruminations about running, and so I was always looking around for the right running story that hadn't really been told yet. And uh, I also have always been fascinated by the early days of long distance running. And when I say early days, it really wasn't very long ago. Right when we talk about it, you know, the first running boom was like in the seventies, and the running culture back then, the sort of roots of running, a lot of it was very sort of rebellious, very Mm countercultural. I mean, the first sort of poster boy of running was Steve Prefontaine who had the mustache and the long hair. And that's what everyone wanted to be like. That That was what running was. It wasn't this mainstream activity that was on the cover of magazines. And it was it was really sort of very niche and very fringe. And there were few things more rebellious that you could do than wake up on a Saturday morning and go out and run 20 miles. Yeah. You'd be the freak on the side of the road. Yeah. It's, it's crazy to think about that because it wasn't so long ago. And now to reflect on the fact that running is like the most popular participation sport with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people doing marathons in some city every single weekend. Uh, but I have a very like romantic notion of the pre-Fontaine and pre-Pre-Fontaine era (laughs) of these bearded guys with mustaches in the early days of Nike with the waffle shoe and no GPS watches and just ragtag, you know, dudes who are essentially hippies, like out there doing something on the fringe. Like there's something just super punk rock and cool about that. It's great. And it really, I mean, you say, I mean, I'm sure it was a little different in some ways because you also had like Billy Mills who right. came out of the Marines mm-hmm. and you know they did some running in the you know in the military so you had sort of that wing of it but a lot of what you just described that's kind of what it was uh-huh. uh, you had these it was it was very fringe and so I've always sort of liked that idea and then I've always known I've known Bob Larson his main character in the book for a while because he, I knew him as Meb Kaflesky's coach, which right. was how most people knew him, or maybe some people out here knew him as the longtime UCLA track coach. Um, but I never really knew his backstory until one, I, I got invited to a documentary about him that was made by one of his former runners. Uh, and it told this story, uh, it sort of had this mention of his origins, which was with this group of, like we said, these kind of hippie runners mm-hmm. in late 1960s, early 70s San Diego uh, called themselves the Hummel Toads. And this group of runners who sort of come out of nowhere to win the 1976 National Cross Country Championship back when that 
was just about the biggest race other than the Boston Marathon. Uh And these were his lab rats. Like these were the guys that, that he used to come up with his theories of how to run far fast. Uh, He had done a lot of thinking about it, but it was going to take experimentation. And he came along with these guys and he was working with them for years in terms of sort of figuring out his methods. Right. And so I, and I just really loved that story. And I, and then I saw, and I saw a picture of these guys too. And there's a picture on like you know, yeah, page right three in, of the right book, book right. because that was the picture when I just remember sitting and watching this documentary. Um, and I saw that picture and I thought, oh, who the hell are those guys? Yeah. I gotta, I gotta find out who those guys are. And I thought if they're interesting, that might be a good story because you need good characters. Right. And I started calling them. The, the maker of the film, this guy, Robert Lusitania, was you know, incredibly generous. He said, that would be great if you wrote a book about this. Here's all my friends' phone numbers. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I, I called them and you know, each one had just a great story. I started asking them, you know, why, do you run, why did you run? Why yeah, did you start running? I think you said something like, if they had a really boring answer to that first question, you would think, well, maybe there's not a book. Right. Well, let's just see how they respond to that. Right, and not one of them said, I don't know, it was just something I was kind of good at and I just sort of did. They all like, had thought really hard about what they were doing out there. And they all had really sort of visceral emotions mm-hmm. about how it made them feel why they were doing it, what they would have been trying to accomplish, and where it had sort of brought them in life. And, and I think e- yeah, each one of those had you know, some reason, something that they were like, to go back to a point you made a minute ago, they were all running from something and running towards something. Yes. Right? It's, the answer to that question is a combination of both of those things, I think, with most people. Most people, I would think. If yeah. you're the kind of person who's I don't know if you, you know, I guess the glass, glass half, half empty person, if, you, if you're neurotic or if you are, you know, self-conscious and uh-huh. self-aware and you like to think about these things, then yes, uh, there's often an interesting answer right. to those things. So at this moment in time, uh, the U.S. was certainly not known as any kind of big running power, right? And well, in the very 60s little, and 70s? Well, no, like at the, at, the, at the beginning of like this journey, there wasn't a lot of science and understanding about how to train. Nobody right? knew. Nobody knew yeah. anything. People had ideas, but it was one of those things that it was all, it was all, well, he did that and he won a gold medal. So we should do that. Right, but no real thought There was science. very little science behind it, very little experimentation. And that was the thing that really sort of separated Bob Larson right. out early on from everybody else because he, he ended up at San Diego State, you know, grew up in San Diego for the most part, well, started in Minnesota you know, on a farm uh, with no running water, no electricity. Family moves to San Diego when he was uh, 11 years old. And so he grows up in San Diego, ends up at San Diego and runs in high school, ends up at San Diego Mm -hmm. State and is running at San Diego State and is really interested in physical education and what we now call kinesiology and ends up getting to know this professor named Fred Cash, who is doing some of the first studies on human cardio health. Because at the time, and we talk about running not being something people did, People just didn't exercise. I mean, the as adults. So the idea it was thought that if you strained your heart after the age of about thirty five, that was like a very dangerous thing to right. do. That was to sort of risk massive cardiac catastrophic event. Uh-huh. And so nobody. I mean, you just think about that. And this was not very long ago. This is like a little more than fifty years ago, maybe fifty years ago. And at that time. You know, we're sending rockets to the. You know, we're sending people to the moon. Where you know, the Russians actually have a cell phone at this point. You know, they have in, uh-huh. uh, they have invented a phone that can fit in your pocket. So it was sort of like the first cell phone. I mean, the, the modern map of Europe was kind of laid out. Like modernity had happened, and yet when it comes to like cardiac health, we are in the complete dark ages. Uh-huh. I mean, to me, it's completely baffling, and. 
So then there's this guy, Fred Cash, who's doing these studies and he's having these adults in San Diego come a few evenings a week to San Diego State and he's telling them to run and he's taking their, and he's measuring their heart rates. And what he's finding is that the more they run, uh, the more their heart rates are going down, that, they're become, that their hearts are becoming more efficient. Mm-hmm. And Bob at the time is a, a college runner and he's training in summers. And in summers, he does this really radical thing, which is he, he goes and he runs on trails and he runs on roads because he's not running around the track all the time. And he does that. And, he, and then he's working with Fred Cash and looking at this lab. And he has like this aha moment where he thinks, yeah, that's actually what I'm feeling. I feel like the more I run, the longer I run, the, st- the more efficient I feel the better it is. It's It's, so hilarious because it's so self-evident and obvious now to think that that was not something that people were aware of at that time, not so long ago. I mean, like (laughs) Salk had invented the polio vaccine (laughs) and yet people didn't realize the heart was a muscle like any other muscle. Like, you know, do bicep curls, your biceps get bigger, but work out your heart it might die. Uh-huh. Like it doesn't make it doesn't make sense, but right. that that was the idea. No, the heart is just a muscle, like any other muscle. Exercise it, and it will become stronger, and it will become more efficient. So, conventional wisdom at this time, pre you know this epiphany, was for for track and field athletes what, or cross country athletes just go to the track and do. What, I mean, how were they training at that time? You basically had two sort of, I mean, I would call them schools, but one of the schools was really like very much in its infancy. That would be the the Lydiard School. Lydiard was this uh, coach from New Zealand who um, Bob Bowerman at at Oregon Oregon. had gone to visit and had come back with, with, well, Lydiard has the first sort of jogging group Mm -hmm. um, in New Zealand. And his idea was uh, volume you know, run, you got to run more than a hundred miles a week, but he wasn't really focused on intensity. He was mainly focused on the volume and his mantra was trained on strain. So then you, so you had that school on the one side. And then on the other side, you had the sort of traditional Europeans. Um, Emil Zadepec was their hero because he's the only guy that won the 5,000, the 10,000, uh-huh. the marathon, the Olympics. And Zadepec and all the sort of Zatapec disciples were obsessed with intervals. So that was go to the track and do half mile intervals or quarter mile intervals, or you know, at the most three quarters, maybe every once in a while you do some mile repeats. Um, but it was largely, you know, Zatapec would do these, these crazy quarter mile training sessions where he would do like 60 or 65 quarter miles all of them in like 65 seconds with, with you know, a minute rest right. in between. And so Bob comes along and his idea, what he eventually happens up, 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 upon is a sort of middle ground. His two questions were, why do the long runs have to be so slow and why do the intervals have to be so short? What if we try to go hard for a long period of time. What if you go to what he starts talking about as his, your threshold, mm-hmm. your edge, go to that spot right before you're gonna become exhausted if you go at that pace for too long a time and try and stay there. Stay there for a mile today, stay there for a mile and a half tomorrow and slowly build up. And that becomes known what we all call today as tempo runs. Right sort of lactate threshold training, that moment, that place where if you go any harder, it's unsustainable. But if you go just a little bit easier, it's just a little bit too comfortable, like finding that edge and training at, you know, at that for as long as possible and trying to expand your ability to maintain that pace. Right, and it's uncomfortable. I mean, the idea is- It's the worst. Right, you're at a place place where- you're not comfortable, but the idea is to teach your body and teach your mind really how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, mm-hmm. and and that that's okay. Right. It's okay if you're, you're afraid. Not die. You're not going to die. It's okay if you're afraid of it. 
um, because we're all probably afraid of it. It's not, you know, it's a learned behavior to go to the place that makes you uncomfortable and to stay there mm -hmm. and to think, don't slow down, actually try and go a little bit faster. See if there's one more click mm -hmm. I can get to. And that was really, that, that's sort of the central revelation of what he had his runners doing. And it was all measured. I mean, he would take in their pulse rates. It wasn't, he would have groups of runners. He would, he would do, you know, he had a control group and then he had the experimental group and he'd take their pulses, you know, in the middle of their runs, he would see how much, how much they were straining, how much these guys were straining. And he would look at the results and who was getting better. Uh -huh. And that's what he came upon. So his, his methodology, he was seeing, he was seeing bigger gains in more compressed periods of time than control groups or people that were training in accordance with these other methodologies. Definitely, yeah. It's interesting because all three of those modalities, there's wisdom to all of them. I mean, the sort of um, initial, you know, volume, you know, concept. I mean, that's sort of, the legacy of that is kind of the Maffetone method. Like that's, I train with that like all the time, like building, building that efficiency from the ground up as opposed to the top down, which is what happens when you're threshold training. And the interval training, like now, I feel like in modern times, the best, you know, approach, I mean, depending upon distance and, you know, what level you're at is some combination of all of those things. Yes, and that's the thing you have to do. I mean, and now everybody says, you know, you gotta have three elements to your training. You gotta, you know, you have to have, uh, you gotta have volume, you gotta have, you know, those threshold runs, uh, or I'm sure if you're cycling, same thing, or if you're swimming, the same mm -hmm. thing, threshold swims. Um, and then you have to do, you know, some of those short intervals, the workouts right. and stuff, you know, you have to build, build it from all three. But while you're doing that, if you're interested in distance running, if that's your thing, the intervals probably shouldn't be too short. Yeah. And the, and the long runs shouldn't be too slow. If you have goal, I mean, if if your goal is just to finish, then you know, go as slow as you want. Yeah. Like, who cares? Yeah, I mean, uh, but if you are really focused on, or even slightly focused on improvement and getting faster, uh, and I've and I will say, I've never met, I've never met someone who ran a race and then didn't say, "I wonder if I could do it faster." Uh huh. That's just like a very, I just feel it's like a that's a, human it's a very human thing. Yeah. Um, and so, so if, if you ever have that, that thought, I mean, that's the kind of thing I'm speaking to here, right. that drive that we have. Well, the other, the other radical thing is that he, that Larson did is he took them off the track, which at the yeah. time was anathema, right? Like every day you're supposed to go to the track and try to be better than you were the day before and just hammering these repeats on the clock. And I know just from my history of being a swimmer, like that, that it, there's a huge mental toll that comes with that because you know, you're in a swimming pool, it's a fixed distance, there's a pace clock. And if you're not hitting these repeats at times you know, that are better than you were the week before or even the day before, you start to think like, am I making any progress? Like it's very hard to, you, you just can't go hard every day. And there was a period of time where that was the philosophy, just go in and just like go as hard as you can every single day. And for him to take these athletes off the track, get onto the trails, you know, you, you don't really, you, there's no GPS watches. They don't know exactly what pace they're running and just to learn how to go on feel and practice these surges and being at that, you know, that edge had to be some mental reprieve. Well, the track and the pool probably is really, really good for one person and that's the coach. They because can the coach can, stay, can stand in the middle of the track or can stand on the pool deck and can have the watch and they can monitor everything. And, you know, he or she is not the one going around in circles like a hamster all afternoon or going back and forth in the water all, all day and, you know, driving them, you know, going, going slowly going mad. Um, but when you get off the track or you get out of the pool, uh, it's just, I mean, for obvious reasons, it's liberating. Yeah. Um, you feel free. You can go, you're going from point A to point B. 
And the good thing about Bob is that he started coaching when he was really young. So, you know, this first team of runners he coached at Monta Vista High School in San Diego, you know, they show up for cross country practice on the first day and they're looking around for the coach and the windbreaker. And now he's actually the guy wearing shorts and the t-shirt yeah, and running right shoes. Down. And he says, let's go. Mm-hmm. And they run together. And he was running with his runners, uh, you know, until he couldn't keep up anymore. Right. Or even, and even, even when, you know, he was, in his thirties and certainly slower than the people that he was training, you know, he would run the first, he would run the warm up with them. He would run the fi- first five, six miles with them and then let them go. Uh-huh. Uh, he was like a 420 run- miler. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. At one point it was a 420 miler um, and a 20 and a 24 second, 200 runner. I mean, he's, yeah. he had some wheels, uh, but you know, he, so he was sort of build that, trust equation that way and you know he he's still he's 80 years old he still runs he lives on you know he lives on on top of one of the brentwood hills and it's it's about two miles up the hill to get up to his house and i was sitting on his deck with him last night having a beer and he said and he says yeah it's hell of a workout i did it a couple weeks ago Uh uh-huh and as I sort of said, you ran up the hill a couple of weeks ago. And he's like, oh yeah, it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Like he still run, you know, he still mm-hmm. runs most days. Usually drives his car down to the bottom of the hill and runs on the flats. But uh, I mean, it's that idea that he runs, you know, straight up uh, Tiger Tail Road or whatever yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know and that. He, it's steep. He, it's really pretty steep. darn steep. Yeah. yeah. Um, when he was coaching UCLA, he would on Sunday mornings he would tell his runners, you know run up to my house and, uh, you know, there'll be pancakes waiting uh-huh. for you. And he did it sort of as bonding, but also it was a good hill. What does, he, what does he think of the book? Like he has to be thrilled. Uh, he, it, took, it took some getting used to for him. He uh-huh. is, you know, he has these, <laughs> he has these um, Minnesota roots. And uh, when I was, wor- I was working on this book and I, you know, from the beginning, and you got to sort of figure out what the book is about, and you have to sort of figure out, uh, you know, we, we, sometimes we call it the mule. You know, who's going to carry the book? Uh-huh. Who's the character who's going to carry the story? And that wasn't immediately apparent to me in terms of how it was going to be structured. You know, I thought maybe it would be about all these different characters, and it is about all these different characters. But um, at some point it became clear to me, you know what, this story needs to stay as close to Bob Larson as possible. It's really his story. He's the only guy in America who was present at the birth of the running boom, the collapse of American distance running, and the person who brought it back and resuscitated it. Mm. And, you know, that's really like an incredible story. And that's what sort of the book was about. But in the same way, um, you know, he, I don't have any business relationship with him. I was just interviewing him along the way and I wasn't sharing drafts of it with him. Um, so, I mean, Billy Bean, the Oakland A's president, yeah. you know, he didn't know Moneyball was really about him until he got sent, you know, a galley, uh, an advanced copy of it. And a little you know, shell shock. He was a little yeah. shell shock that he was the main <laughs> character. And so then when I sent it to Bob, uh, once it was sort of in book form, I, I sent it to him to have a look. And also I needed, I needed him to fact check it, yeah. uh, make sure I wasn't getting stuff wrong. Uh, it took a little, he was sort of a little a surprised little and he was a little, he was just sort of take, he was just, he's just not, he's a very humble person. Um, the reason nobody has heard about him is because even though he would have had every right to 25 years ago or however many years ago when he's producing like gold medalist after gold medalist to have written a book and called it The Larson Way or something uh-huh. like that and gone on any number of talk shows or you know gone on the circuit and become a franchise into himself – He's never thought of, he's not the kind of person who would right. ever think of doing something like that. 
So uh, it was my great good fortune that he's sort of this unknown guru of American distance uh-huh. running. And so he's a little, so he loves the book now, um, but it took him a little while to get used to it. Right, is he doing like events with you? Will he come out and speak yeah. about this he, time? And, he was with yeah. me uh, last week. We did an event with New York Roadrunners and um, uh, it, we're, while I'm in LA, we're doing something with the LA Running Club oh, cool. uh, and South Bay Runners at uh, one of the schools in Santa Monica during their weekly workout. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, I think he's having a pretty good time with this. It's, cool. a, it's a bit of a kick for him. My my favorite part of the book is is just the the kind of bad news bears story of these toads, right? This ragtag group of of young runners who you know, don't sort of cut the claw, cut this, you know, image of elite athletes and how he shapes these young minds and and athletes into into champions and the story of them going to the AAU championships without any money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they show up, they don't really have uniforms or, you know, just fish out of water kind of thing. I mean, how can you not like root for these guys? That Yeah, that's what it was. I mean, they have no, they had been, they had been turned down by the early version of Nike, Bob knew Jeff Hollister and had said, I got a pretty good team here. Can you give me some money to get him to Philadelphia? And he said, who's on the team? And he's basically said, eh, not really impressed. I've never really heard of those guys. Um, Sorry, not into it. Uh And uh, yeah, they were a bunch of, these were not like the elite of the elite. Look, they were fast. They were some good. They were great natural runners, and they had good careers. Uh, you know, Ed Mendoza ran a two ten marathon in Boston on a really hot day, and he was on the Olympic team in nineteen seventy six. So there were some good runners there, but they weren't sort of the blue blood mm-hmm. runner in terms of they weren't the sort of chosen the chosen ones who I'm sure you grew up with those guys in swimming who, you know, they're they right. want, they, the guys who are always good as teenagers and some of them go on to be very good as adults. And also just the, these, there are these programs that you know, like, oh, well, the good people come out of these programs, like in, you know, in running it's Oregon or, you know, what, what have you, there's certainly, you know, that exists in swimming. And here you have, you know, Larson with this with this group, they're unknown. They're not. Yeah, he, there's he, no he, legacy. No, he was a he was yeah. a Grossmont Junior College. Right. That's where they all. That's basically where most <laughs> of them started. It was yeah. Grossmont Grossmont Junior College uh-huh. in you know in San Diego. He was only allowed to you know, the community college system. You aren't allowed to recruit. You you. It's like a public high school. Your your right. district is drawn and. He could draw kids from eight schools and eight high schools in the region. And of course, once he had some success, some people start like moving into the region mm-hmm. so they can go and run for, and run for him. But it was basically whoever shows up on day one. Right. And of course, he would look in the local high schools. And, but his recruiting amounted to he would yeah, have a barbecue at his house and buy a keg of beer and invite the local track coaches over once a year and say like, so who do you got? Who's coming in? Who should I keep my eye on? Yeah, That was it. And they came to him, but they worked differently and they worked harder. And so he would show up to these invitational meets with all the big four-year schools and he was be- they were better than them. Wow. They were beating, they were beating all of them because they were just, because they had happened on to the, the sort of secret sauce. You, know, mm-hmm. you talk about them as a team. Um, and I think we mentioned before that people think of this as a very sort of solitary activity and in individual sport. But, you know, we talked about Larson's first principle of going to your edge. The second one was you got to train. You cannot train alone. Like you are, you are part of a team. The group is more powerful than the individual. You know, lean on your teammates, they will pick you up on the days when you are slacking off, when you're falling out of the pack, you're gonna try and run harder to keep up with the pack. And you know, tomorrow you're gonna be the one that's leading the pack and someone else is gonna be falling off and they're gonna try and keep up with you. Um, it's a, you know, it's like the, I think I, I've mentioned it, it's, it's like the Peloton and cycling, right. you know, you're just, that, that big clump, 
it's really powerful. <laughs> I mean, there's aerodynamic reasons in cycling why it's really powerful, but psychologically it's really powerful too. The right. last thing you wanna do is get chewed up and spit out and right. left behind. So there was that idea. And then the third idea was just that where you're born and how you're born and how you grew up is not your destiny. Like you can change your destiny. If you do the work, if you do the right things and work as hard as anyone, you can be better tomorrow than you were yesterday. I love that because it would be easy to say that his philosophy is lactate threshold training. But in truth, his philosophy is a philosophy of life. It's applicable to running and being excellent in running, but those are principles and rules to live by no matter what it is that you do or seek. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's honestly, like that's really the main thing that sort of drew me to this story. You know, I wanted to write a running book that was, yeah, it was about running, but you know, running is sort of the lens. I would say running and writing are sort of the two lenses through which I approach life. I, I, mm -hmm. And I don't, I've been a sports writer for about 20 years. I've been a journalist for 25 years. I don't think I would do this if, and I wouldn't have sort of gravitated towards sports if I didn't think it had a lot of stories that would convey sort of these lessons and not morals. And I say that, it mm -hmm. sounds sort of uh, preachy and stuff, but I'm very drawn to stories that can speak to things beyond the playing field and beyond the field of competition. Because these are the stories that sort of help me get through my day right. and uh, have uh, provide me with, like I said, that that sort of lens of which of, of which I can sort of have some revelations and epiphanies about what's important, how to approach things, um, and so, in when I'm doing my job right, you know, readers are getting that benefit as yeah. well. And it's very Murakami. Yeah, that's sort of a, that's that's the hope yeah. um, is to sort of convey that and hope that people, you know, if this book makes you love running and be faster, terrific. Um, but if it makes you think it's okay to be uncomfortable, I actually really want to push myself to a kind of threshold, um, whether it's in relation, in my relationships or in my uh, job, or even just, you know, I want to start painting. I've never painted before. And I'd really like to try that, even though I know I'm going to be terrible at it. Mm -hmm. uh, then great, and that, that's that. Then that would be the 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 greatest thing. Yeah, having the courage to approach that edge and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is where you meet yourself and where the growth occurs. Yeah, that's where the man. I mean, that was the whole idea with with, with Bob when he you know, because where you are. When you feel like you're going to collapse and you don't, that's where the magic uh -huh. is. Like that's where you find truth about yourself. Yeah. That's where you, that's where you can take that moment into a race and know that when you're really hurting, you can think back to no, no, no. I've been here. I've actually been here before. Right. I can do this. I can. I can keep at this for another mile or two and I can keep up with this guy. Um, and it, it spills over into everything that you do. You know, you develop this resiliency and this willingness to confront that edge in other areas of your life. And, and as a result, your life expands. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. It, it definitely does. And, and, you know, you just can't, you know, whether you're a runner or not, whether it's running or swimming or whatever it is that you do where you can kind of find that flow state sense, you return from that more complete, like with clarity that you didn't have beforehand. Like, I'm sure you've never come back from a run and said, I wish I hadn't done that. Or, you know, some problem that you were wrestling with by allowing it to kind of exist in your subconscious while you're running, you come back with a solution to it. And I don't know how that works or why that works, but it works. No, I definitely do a lot of my best writing while I'm running. There's no question yeah. about that. Um, I can tell you exactly where I, I was when I figured out the subtitle of the book, which was, which is, you know, a band of misfits and the guru who unlocked 
uh-huh. uh, the secrets of speed. I was having a really hard time with like that verb, like searching for the secrets of speed or searching. And then like, you know, I was in Central Park and I was just about on the north end, like at 102nd Street. And all of a sudden, like, and I'd been thinking about it for like an hour as I was, was about an hour uh-huh. into my run. Right before the hill back up to the yeah, west side. Yeah, right, exactly. I was like, <laughs> and all of a sudden it was like unlocked came from me. And I was like, yes, unlocked. And it was there. And, uh, you know, everybody, you know, my family at this point is quite used to me, the image of me like coming back into the apartment from a run and mm-hmm. sort of grabbing the closest pen and paper and scribbling things down before I forget them. Yeah. Things that I've thought of, things I want to pursue, lines and stories that I want to use. Just uh, Do you ever have to notes. stop in the middle of the run to like record a voice memo or something well, like that? Well, I don't that? run with my phone <laughs> yeah. because um, I, I hate carrying things and, you know, I run to get away from stuff. Yeah especially my phone. <laughs> um, and so I got nothing, I got nothing to record uh-huh. on. Um, I don't, I don't have a, uh, Apple watch. I've or, had that thing though, where I'll have some idea mid run yeah. and it's like, please don't let me forget this. Right. But sometimes I do, you know, because yep. I don't want to stop and make a note or something like that. I'm sure it, I'm sure that I, I lose some of it, but I feel like your mind can be a pretty good filter. And if it's really, if it is important, you'll remember it or if you really, or if you play a game and you think about ways Mm -hmm. to remember it, you will. One of the things you do in the book is you also weave in your own personal relationship with running. Um, and I, and I like that. I mean, I think it, it, it allows the reader to, you know, connect with why you're writing the book and, you know, identify some aspect of themselves in, in yourself because you're relatable in your relationship to running. So the, the question that I have is that you ask all of these other people is why do you run? Like, how do you answer that for yourself? Well, I mean, the, this sort of funny, well, it's funny to me at least, answer is uh, I, yeah, I've run 23 marathons at this point and I'm grown like kind of obsessed with trying to, complete that distance as quickly as possible and uh-huh. to see how far, see where I can get to. And, you know, within the confines of a full-time job and raising children right. and reading books and writing books. And so, um, because, and the reason I thought of have come upon as to why I'm focused on my time is because I, I guess I kind of feel like if I can keep getting faster, then I'm not really getting older. Right, or you're not gonna die. Or I'm not gonna die, right. <laughs> Which is ridiculous, <laughs> of course, but you know, but it's a fun uh-huh. little game to distract me from it. And it makes, us, you know, it makes you feel good, makes you get out of bed in the morning. Uh, so there's, there's that reason. It's a little sort of existential uh-huh. game. Um, you know, but it, it, you know, a few other reasons why I run, I just never feel more alive um, than when I'm running. I never feel, uh, I, I never, my thoughts never feel as sort of ordered. Uh, there's a sense of peace mm-hmm. that I'm getting, even when, um, you know, doing half mile intervals, uh, you know, in that sort of dreaded eight by 800 workout that right. everybody has to do at some point when you're trying so to what go is that faster. Called? Like the Michigan 800. Yeah, they're, 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 they're called, there's a, there's an editor at Runner's World. I think it's in Bart Yasso. Oh yeah, the Yasso, Yasso 800s. 800s. Yeah, yeah. Um, they really work. Uh, I mean, it's it's torture. It's, I don't know. I was curious what what's the swimming equivalent of the eight of like the eight hundred. Is it is it two hundred? I mean, it, I think it depends on what what discipline, like what stroke you swim, what your event is. I mean, I would do these crazy sets of like ten times two hundred fly. That probably would be the most similar uh, version of that. On some level, that sound. It's, it's funny you say that because because my eight hundred time in running is about I think my two hundred time in swimming. Uh-huh. So I'm sort of curious. And when I'm yeah. swimming, I sometimes do sets of two hundred because I can't run every day. Right, um, it's the same amount. It's like of cross time. training. It's a similar amount of time you're pushing yourself. But uh, so even when I'm like pushing myself like that, I'm very conscious of like there is a kind of piece to this. Mm. Um, there's a quiet, uh, that happens. Um, and, and I think it's sort of getting to that quiet and getting to that 
you know, it's just it's it's just very elemental. Uh, you know, it's just yeah. you and your shoes and the road, and uh, maybe sometimes there's ten thousand people surrounding you, um, but it just it just feels right. It's like it feels. I don't want to say I'm like I am my best self when I'm running because that would be that just doesn't sound it's, right. It, but it's one of those. There's truth to that. It's one yeah. of those. Ta- it's one of those. It's a. It's a. It's a thing that I do where I feel really comfortable with who I am. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, it's, it, other people have other things that they do uh, where, they, where they feel that way. And that's a, that's a spot where I'm just, I'm, I'm just in a good, I'm in a good place. Yeah. I had an opportunity many years ago, uh, my family, we were in Santa Fe just for a couple of days to get away. And it was during a period of time when Ryan Hall and Sarah Hall were living there. And Ryan's like, hey, we're gonna be down at the track, like doing a workout, like why don't you come down? And I, and I got to watch him do Yasso 800s while I was like on the outer lane plotting, doing my eight minute miles around the you know, track. And I've just never seen anything like that. Like I was just you know, marveling at what a specimen he was it's at that period amazing. of time running around the track. It was yeah. unbelievable. And his pulse probably went not going higher. No, it about didn't seem like any big deal. Like yeah, that. It's like one fifty five <laughs> yeah. or yeah. something. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing thing. But having said that, did you talk to him after? And was he like talking about your running also? Well, he's a very generous, curious person. Uh, but you know, but and runners, incredibly humble. Well, runners. Oh, oh, well, y- yes, he is. All those, all those things. Yeah. Um, terrific person. But one of the things I love about running is in the DNA of the sport is there's this, there's, there's a, not much of a gulf mm-hmm. between the elites and the you know, workaday runners in terms of talking to each other about what they do. There's this understanding that we're all sort of doing the same thing in a way that if you went to try, if you were a golfer and you went to try and talk to Phil Mickelson and you started right. talking about like, you know, the match you were playing at your club the other day, you know, he would laugh at you. Right. He, would be, he would like make some joke about, you know, your drive or your putter or something like that. Whereas I've n- honestly never met an elite runner um, who wasn't interested about how you were training, wanted to, was interested in hearing, you know, how you felt or how somebody else felt during, you know, Boston in 2014 when it was kind of hot or, uh, or in 2018, like what was your experiencing of, of it when it was, you know, 37 degrees and pouring rain? It's, that's just part of the culture. Abdi Abdi Rahman said to me like last year when I said like, Abdi, I'm not comparing what I do to what you do. And he said, he said, what do you mean, man? We, we all experience the same pain. We just experience it at different times. That's amazing. There's this scene in the book where, where you get a text from Meb the night before. Right. Was it Boston? You're I was right. for New York. For New York, yeah. And he's like, you know, suffering on the horizon tomorrow or something like pain that. Is like, in the, pain is in yeah. the forecast <laughs> yeah. for all of us. Yeah. Right, and I just thought, like, how cool is that? Like, the, here's a guy who's lining up, you know, for the race of his life. He's and, trying to win, and and he had the the mindset to like check in with you, yeah, and see how you were doing. Yeah, that's like, and they, and that's just not me and Meb because I was a reporter. I mean, there's there's you could find all kinds of people who the night before the marathon are you know trading Instagram messages mm-hmm. with. Uh, you know, you fill in the elite runner. You know, this is you know they're passing time. Everybody's nervous about the race, Everybody's and you're all running the, the same forecast. course at essentially right. the same time, which makes it really beautifully unique. Right. It's a, so there's a there's a camaraderie there. Um, we all it may it may be somewhat rooted in a sort of common affection for it because being being a long distance runner. Uh, and being an elite marathoner is a very you know intentional career choice. Being any kind of elite athlete is obviously going to take a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. 
Um, but being an elite marathoner, I mean, that is a lot of time, a lot of time alone, a lot of really hard workouts, um, a lot of pain, and you only get two cracks at it a year if you're yeah. a marathoner because you can't really, your body can't really right. perform well more than twice a year uh, in a marathon, maybe three times in like 14 months or something, but not more than that. So the payoff, who knows if it's gonna stakes pay off. Stakes are high. Yeah, stakes are pretty high. So to do it, you really better love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you, you got it's a it's a thing that it's a thing that you're going to be passionate about. Right. So Larson helps usher in this new era of running and contributes to the boom that we see occur in the '70s with this kind of embrace of long distance running and the kind of Jim Fix era and Prefontaine and all of that. Uh, there's this explosion in popularity with running, but it's not long after that the United States like takes this dip. Right, and we kind of disappear. I think it's, a no, it's like a from, death spiral. Yeah, like what? Explain what happened, and then how it was resuscitated. Because we're in this amazing period right now, where we're seeing the resurgence of the Americans on the world stage in a way that we haven't seen since that era. So, I mean, it's hard to say exactly what happened, but here's two things that definitely. Did have, I mean, it's hard to draw the exact cause and effect relationship, but two things that definitely did happen. One is Alberto Salazar, mm-hmm. who, um, you know, is just about the greatest American distance runner ever. Uh, you know, won New York three times, won Boston, and is just absolutely flying in his career in the early 1980s. And everybody expects he's going to win the gold medal in the 84 Olympics. And that'll be sort of a crowning achievement for him. And on the way to the 84 Olympics, he essentially just hits a wall. He cannot run fast anymore. Um, he's just, he's, he's not getting slower. He's not getting faster. He's getting slower. And he should be at the prime of his career. He's like 26 years old. And... I mean, only later would you find out that you know, he was dealing poorly with some nagging injuries and not getting the right treatment. He was also suffering from depression. Um, so that was a problem. But the lesson that everybody took from Salazar, and nobody trained harder than Salazar. And Lar- Larson didn't train Salazar. He was on the other side of the country. But Salazar was definitely from the Larson school mm-hmm. of threshold running. I mean, right. he went beyond the threshold. He nearly died in the Falmouth race uh, in Cape Cod. He, you know, he, the the Boston Marathon, the one that's known as the Duel in the Sun between him and Dick Beardsley mm-hmm. is sort of this just epic race um, on an incredibly hot day. And, you know, he was just completely fearless. And then, like I said, he ran into a wall. And the false lesson that everyone took from that was he probably was training too hard. He overtrained, uh, outran himself. You know, maybe we only get a certain number of steps in life before mm-hmm. our bodies start to break down. So don't use up too many of your steps in training or else this, you're going to be done at 26. <laughs> Is this when people are starting to realize for the very first time that overtraining could be a thing? I mean, probably. That's, that's, yeah, overtraining becomes a big topic of discussion at that point. But in the long distance community, the idea is don't overtrain. How about we only run like 90 miles a week? Uh huh. And we go back to that train, don't strain idea. And, and that just craters the whole thing. And it just whole, craters the whole yeah. thing. I mean, I think, I mean, the, the numbers of people, I mean, there were dozens, uh, I think scores of Americans who could who, who could run a marathon faster than 2.15 in the 70s um, and early 80s. And by the 90s, there was like one. Uh-huh. I mean, 2.15 is not that fast. I mean, it's crazy fast for you and me. But um, nowadays, 2.15, you're three miles behind Elliot Kipchoge. Right. <laughs> in the Berlin Marathon. So so to give you an idea, like it's, you're not... You're certainly not world class at 215. So 
Bob Larson is sitting there. At this point, he's coaching UCLA. And as a college coach, he is focused on recruiting, you know, the, the way you win national championships in college, which is what your, your, your mission is as a college coach, is you get these very versatile quarter milers, essentially. Mm. These just absolute specimens who can uh, run quarter miles, they can run 200s, they can run relays. They're so fast that they can, if you need them to do a long jump or a triple jump, they can get points in those events as well. So he's very focused on on those folks and winning national championships. And he's winning a bunch of them and doing quite well uh, and producing lots of Olympic gold medalists. Uh, and he's not so focused on long distance running. Mm. And it's, a, it's his original love, it's his original passion, but he's not paying that much attention to it. And then he... Um, happens upon this high school senior named Meb Kifleski. And uh, he has this incredible story. You know, the family moved here from Eritrea when he was in seventh grade. And his father, you know, was a refugee and escaped the civil war there. So um, the war with Ethiopia. And, uh, you know, so he's this immigrant kid and, and Larson gives him a full scholarship to UCLA mm-hmm. and brings him there. And Meb becomes you know, his vehicle for this project that's going to, that basically takes up, um, you know, his post-retirement life from UCLA, which is to resuscitate American long distance running. You know, Meb's going to be the guy uh, that he, he has the tools, he has the discipline, he has the willingness where he thinks he can, and he has the talent where he thinks he can take him and turn him into a champion. It's going to take some time but what it's mainly going to take is it's mainly going to take doing the workouts that he was doing with the Hummel Toads back in the 1970s right. with one extra wrinkle, which is elevation. Um, and that's because that has become all the rage. And that's what the Kenyans and Ethiopians are doing. Right. Did he have a conscious sense that he was trying to resuscitate American running? Or Absolutely. did he just see, so it wasn't just Meb. He's like, we need to bring this whole thing back and Meb is gonna be my cipher. Yeah, he like, was horrified by it. Uh-huh. I mean, the, the 2000 Olympics, he had already been named, I think the distance coach for the 2004 Olympics. And the 2000 Olympics, the Americans could only qualify one right. man for, uh, for that race in the marathon. Um, and it was, you know, instead of three spots, which used to be, you know, it, used to be it, it had been in the 70s, it had been like a real battle to mm-hmm. get one of those three spots uh, in the Olympics. And now we couldn't even meet the qualifying standard right. to, get, to get more than one person. And just to get back to the earlier question, because I said there was two things that happened. The other thing that happened in the 80s was Sebastian Coe became like the biggest figure right. in, run, in track and field. And his father wrote this book and a lot of what he, Kof, what what his father focused on with you know training Sebastian and raising him was interval you know interval training and not so much volume and not so much threshold running even though Co had been doing a lot of that training but just with like a a, a small group that his father wasn't really involved with and so that didn't get a lot of attention mm. so people were very focused in the same way that you'd be very focused now on. Um, you know, how Roger Federer, you know, developed his tennis right. game. Right. People became very focused on how Sebastian Coe had become a good Right, player. which was antithetical to Larson's whole trip. Right, exactly. So in the late 90s, when he's trying to revive this, you know, his idea is, no, and this is also what's going on at this time is the East Africans are starting to dominate everything. And so there's these, people who are sort of doing these studies and putting out these theories about, you know, well, they've evolved from the Serengeti to have longer Achilles tendons or their their muscle fibers are different. And that their was- Their lung a, capacity is larger. They're, and, and because they're so thin, they're able to cool themselves. Right, there's all kinds right. of theories that are out there. And Larson's idea is, no, they're just working really hard yeah. and they're living in the Rift Valley at 7,000 feet. And they're training in groups and they're doing, and like, you know, he traveled and got their note, took notes on what their training regimens were. And he said, 
this is what they're we were doing. doing. <laughs> they're doing what yeah. we were. They're doing what we were doing. That's right. A, you know, there's no. There's, they're out. Like I had. You, you must know Knox Robinson. Do you know Knox? I don't know Knox. Um, Black Roses, NYC Running Club. Oh yes, Brooklyn. okay. Yeah. Yes. So I had him on the podcast, and he spent a lot of time in Africa, like hanging out with those guys and training with them, and he tells crazy, amazing stories. But when you were recounting, you know, the philosophy of Larson, I was thinking, like, yeah, that's exactly what those guys are doing. They run in a group. There, there's a lot of joy. There's a lot of camaraderie. They do put in a lot of easy, slow miles that they're running together. And then when they, they choose their moments on the track and when they hit the track, it's like full on, full on. But they're living this lifestyle at altitude um, where there's no distractions. And this is just, it's a lifestyle. It's yeah. not like what they do when they're not doing other things. And that's not, and, and the American distance runners at the time were, training off on their own, mostly at sea level. And they just weren't, and weren't putting in the, and weren't putting in the hard work. And so Larson creates this group called the Mammoth Track Club, uh, mainly so that Meb has a group to train with. And they go up to Mammoth Lakes and they camp out there uh, at 8,000 feet. And four years later, there's, Six marathon medals that are right. given out every Everyone's Olympics. Everyone's going up to Mammoth, right? Like, so, training in the snow, right? But six years, <laughs> yeah. four years later, you know, when there's six marathon medals given out, this uh-huh. little group at Mammoth gets two of them. Meb gets the silver, yeah. and Dina Castor gets the bronze, and that's a pretty good ratio for when you had when you weren't even close to having any four years before. Then you create this little group, and over that period of time, these groups start to pop up, and you know. Brooks Hansen runners, Nike has the Oregon project and also uh, Schumacher's group. Now you would just never become a professional runner in America without choosing a sponsor and moving to a place right. where other people are training. Whether- and they're like these little fiefdoms, these little cults. Almost, yeah. Colts makes it sound. I don't know. I, without the pejorative, right? Kind of without the pejorative, but it's like it's it's the training group. It's the yeah. gang, and they work together. Um, they're pretty inspiring. You know, Hoka has a group in Flagstaff. Uh, um, there's, you know, there, there's a couple. There's a few people still up at Mammoth. Dina Castro still lives at Mammoth. Lexi Pappas went up there to train with her, and so there's a there's a group. Of, there are some runners that are still up there. But there, you know, Alberto has his Oregon Project mm-hmm. group, and um, Shalane Flanagan has a group, another group of runners in Portland, Portland, and they do altitude camp. They go for altitude camps. I, I think you're probably better off if you go live at altitude. Um, I'm sort of a big believer in that live right. high, train low philosophy. It seems to seems to work pretty well for the people who do it. I understand why you wouldn't want to live at altitude, just because there's not a lot of civilization in America at 8,000 feet. Um, you have to, you, yeah. have to, you have to, it's a lifestyle. Like you said, there's some sacrifice involved. So Larson takes Meb up to Mammoth. And at the time he's like, what is he like 39th in the world at the 10 K or something like that? Like he's not, it's not like he's on everyone's radar as the next great thing. And when he gets on the starting line of the Olympic marathon in 2004, he has the 39th best marathon, in marathon. time in the field. Uh huh. You, know, right. you know, there's... I don't know, 80 <laughs> runners in the field or something uh-huh. like that. Um, but he's done some pretty hard work the last year in terms of getting ready for that right. race. Uh, you know, Larson had done, Larson and Joe Vigil, um, who he had recruited up to Mammoth. Um, Joe Vigil was sort of, running readers might know him because he's a character in Born to Run mm-hmm. uh, in in. in in the study of the, he had done a lot of study of the um, ultra marathoners, and he had led this team at North Adams State to you know an ungodly number of of championships. Um, but he's really sort of the nation's foremost authority on elevation training, uh-huh. and Bob recruits him to run the Mammoth Track Club with him, and uh, they had. You know, they knew that that Athens Marathon course backwards and forwards. They knew the weather. They had had Meb and Dina training, you know, in the middle of summer in black tights and turtlenecks mm-hmm. and hats to make them uncomfortable, make them understand like just how ungodly hot it was going to be 
during the Olympic marathon. And then the the search for the ultimate ice vest and how to cool them yeah, and like right. both Dina and Meb showing up at the starting line with ice vests on yeah, until I mean, the very last moment. Right. It's a game, you know, he, his whole theory was this is a game to keep your core as cool as possible for as long as possible. That's the that's the ultimate limiter at the highest level. Is it? I think it is. Yeah, there's been studies on that. Um, the the people that are able to you know avoid that boiling over point or who are more efficient or effective at maintaining a lower core temperature are able to maintain the efficiency and the high level output for a longer period of time. But once you kind of tip the scale and you start overheating and you can't um, regulate that anymore, that's when performance declines, right? Yeah. So the longer you can kind of keep that at base level, it's been shown to be a huge factor in performance. I can imagine it. Cause I, I mean, just for, I mean, I'm the furthest thing from an elite runner, but I, I mean, I melt in the heat. Like yeah. it's heat and humidity is just absolute kryptonite. For and it me. affects different people in different ways. Yeah, I and I imagine it affects, I, and I know especially when it affects me, which is I keep getting bad luck or, or I've had several you know moments of bad luck where I train all winter for the Boston Marathon uh -huh. and then I show up at the start line and you know I'm training in 30 degree weather in New York and then it ends up being the first beautiful spring day right. in Boston and like to, this today I mean this year it was 70 degrees and right. humid and but not the year before. The year you before, ran that one. I ran that one really well. That was my best race with right. a 20 mile an hour headwind <laughs> and 37 degrees freezing rain. Uh -huh. That was absolute heaven. But, uh, but you know, I was in as good shape as I've ever been this year and I've never felt more sick in a race. Mm -hmm. And I just, I guess, yeah, I knew four miles in, um, I was just so out of breath on this tiny little incline. And it was just, uh, it was, 20 miles right. later, I was limping, you know, basically. And so I was so sunburned and it, it, mm. like, I, I was like, a, it looked like the rest of the week that I had, like that first day you go to the beach in the spring, like when you're pale as a ghost yeah. and then you come home and you're like, you're just fried. That's what I looked like uh -huh. the day after the Boston Marathon. So, uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's getting back to what we're talking about. I mean, if you can stay cool, it's a great thing. And he had these vests uh, at the Athens Olympics that Meb and Dina were wearing those ice, mm -hmm. ice vests until the very last minute. And now you, it's ubiquitous. You see the, you see Tour de France riders wearing them when they're warming up before the time trials. Like you, you see this happening, you know, across many disciplines of sport now. It's got to start somewhere. Yeah, but it, it's amazing <laughs> when you look back on it though, because all of these things are very elemental and simple. Like, hey, let's let's seclude you. Let's put you at altitude, no distractions. We're gonna get a hardcore group of people and I'm gonna be a bit of a dictator and you're gonna do what I say and you're gonna trust me and you guys are gonna get through this together and I'm gonna push you harder than you've ever been pushed before, but you're gonna be ready and the proof is in the pudding. I mean, that's kind of what he did, right? Yeah, it's not that. It's not like he had some super crazy philosophy about training that, you know, I mean, maybe it was at the time, but it doesn't feel like it. And that's the thing about running though, is like, there's no shortcuts, you know? There's no, there's, it, it's, it's largely about the work. It's largely about patience. It's largely about being committed mm -hmm. and um, that's, you know, a lot of this is, it's the same thing with writing too. You know, it's, it doesn't come quickly or easily. Uh, it takes a lot, it's, it's, it can be very painful. Right. Um, it takes a lot of being honest with yourself. And I think it's uh, like true of, of trying to do anything well. I, I would think so. I only do two yeah. things. I only really try hard at two things, which is running and writing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I imagine, you know, electrical engineering is probably yeah. that way too. I've yeah. never, I mean, I do, I, I do think, you know, get, getting back to that thing we talked about earlier about pushing yourself and doing the thing that's uncomfortable. I have never met the, you know, really kind of like happy person, um, peaceful person, you know, successful person, either financially or just 
has done something really well, uh, who has said, you know, it was, the, you know, it was the key for me. The key for me was playing it safe right. and not taking the risk, not taking any risks. Right. I just never, you know, like you, you never hear that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost always, you know, there was this thing I did and I wasn't really sure, but I kind of rolled the dice and it was uncomfortable and I struggled for a while at it, but it kind of worked out. I know. So why is it so hard for us to take risks then knowing that? Because the default, because it's uncomfortable, because the, because we like want, because you want to be at equilibrium, right? you know, right? You want to, you want to be comfortable. You don't, it's, you know, it's this, it's, why is it hard to, when you're in a new environment, to go up to a stranger and talk to them and introduce yourself? Mm-hmm. It's a learned behavior because that's uncomfortable. That's risky. Yeah. That's weird. You know, that's, and, but if you do that, you might make a buddy, you know, and we know that intellectually. And we know that if we never do that, We'll never make another friend. We it's don't a, want to do it's that. It's a practice in the same way that they discovered the heart is a muscle that can be trained to be stronger, discipline, and your willingness to put yourself in those uncomfortable positions is a practice as well. You start with small things, you acclimate, and then you have to always be kind of increasing the, the temperature or the volume on that. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that it necessarily gets easier, but it kind of does get easier. Or it just gets, or, or it you, just, you, or you you're just used to it. You get used it to it. It becomes your norm. Yeah, you sort of understand it. And I love that. I mean, the thing I love about, I'm, I'm kind of a hot yoga addict. Mm-hmm. And a thing I love about that is that, every, and I guess this is true for all yoga, whether it's hot or at whatever temperature you're doing it at, is that it's always referred to as, a, as your practice. And, you know, there's no, I just love that idea that it's there's just, no end. there's no end. Yeah. It's just practice. It's just your practice. You know, it was practice for what? Well, it's for tomorrow's practice. <laughs> right, 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 right. And I feel like if we, it's a good, it's a, it's a good idea. You know, no one gets out of here alive, right? Uh-huh. So like, what are we, what are we doing? We're just practicing, right? You know, we're just, we're just seeing if we can, Seeing if we can figure it out a little better, a little easier, um, a little smarter and not make the same mistakes because Lord knows we've all made a lot of them. Well, let me know if you discover the secret. Which one? I don't know, (laughs) wherever this is all heading. (laughs) (laughs) All right, well, to what do you attribute this incredible resurgence in, um, in women's long distance running that we're seeing now. Like we're in this golden age right now where we're just seeing performances that we, we haven't seen in, in kind of the history of long distance running on the women's front in terms of American performers. I mean, do you track that to Larson as well? I mean, there has to be other well, factors. Well, I, I, track I track it not so much to Larson, but I track it to someone that he coached, although he wasn't her main coach. Dina? But Dina, yeah. I mean- it helps when you see someone doing, when right. someone breaks through and does something well, uh, it's sort of like where our conversation started with, it's almost like she gave fast, young American women permission to pursue this thing and showed them that if you can, if you pursue it the right way, you can be as fast as anyone, Uh you can win Chicago, you can win London, you can be on the medal stand. And that really helps. I imagine there's a lot more kids in China trying to make the NBA after Yao Ming. Right. Um, That really helps. So, but you know, and that was, you know, we're going back now to her, the heyday of her success was 15 years ago, but you know what? Like Shalane Flanagan wins New York, in her mid thirties, Des finally wins Boston in her mid thirties. You know, they had been close before, but if you think about how old were they when Dina was having her success, that's a, you know, that's an influential moment. That's an influential time. Having said that, there is an infrastructure um, that has been built for women to develop and support them. To develop and support them. Now, 
are the people Unless who are... Unless they get pregnant. Right. <laughs> Which I want to talk about, but go yes. ahead. Um, great series of stories by my friend, my <laughs> co- friend and colleague, Lindsay, Lindsay Krauss. Right? Yeah, she's doing... True. Can I just say, she's done an incredible job. She does great guys. stuff. She does yes. amazing reporting. And it's so refreshing and great to see interesting, in-depth uh, stories about running in the New York Times. Well, that's, I mean, I, had, I, didn't have anything, be, I didn't have anything to do with the pregnancy stuff. Right, but well, she broke that story. But I did, right. But I did, um, when I got to the Times in uh, November of, 2017, I'd sort of read her stuff for a while and she's in a different department. She's not in the sports department. Uh-huh. So she, you know, to lose the, use the loose term, she kind of freelances with us. Uh-huh. Um, you know, one of the first things I did when I was there is I, you know, reached out to her and grabbed her for a cup of coffee. And I said, you know, you're, you have a really good voice and I'm gonna do everything I can to try and turn the New York Times sports section into uh-huh. runner's world. So you've done um, a pretty good right, job. Right. There's a lot of running there's a stories. lot of running stories. I'm very happy I about said, that. Right, I yeah, said. So, so I was going to ask you, like, how much of that is you're doing? Uh, it's pretty much, pretty much <laughs> me. Yeah, and also expanding that 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 lens a little bit more, just to adventure stories in general. Like we're going off on a tangent right now, but like Adam Skolnick's reporting on Colin O'Brady's Antarctica attempt was was astounding astounding I mean, and the yeah. the amount of 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 geography that you that you gave for telling that story in real time and in depth and and the kind of multimedia you know layout um at least digitally as well as in print i mean it was fantastic yeah i mean we take and we we take a lot of crap from sort of traditionalists right. readers uh, fans of stick and ball sports yeah when we do stories like that. Like the Bill and, Simmons crowd. And, yeah, and we take, and we, you know, we take it seriously. You know, like we, we don't want to turn off readers. We want as many readers and subscribers mm-hmm. as, we can, as we can get. Um, you know, having said that, you know, if there was a cooler story out there than two guys ski racing across Antarctica in December, like, I want you to show it. I want to right. show it to me. Like, come on, like, what was going on in the NBA that was uh-huh. so fascinating? What, like, I don't know. There was, <laughs> there were two guys ski racing across I've Antarctica. I've never heard it described so that way, low. but that's what it was. That's what it was. It was, it was a ski race. It was a ski race between <laughs> these two guys across yeah. Antarctica. And I mean, I'm a huge Nordic skiing uh-huh. fan as well, um, but we generally are able, only able to cover that during the Olympics. I would do an occasional story about that, but there's just not a huge readership for it. Uh, but that's what, so he had this race. So yeah, so whenever we're in, whenever these stories come across our desk that are, or we have these possibilities of writing about, you know, big themes, big moments, mm. epic battles, life and death, uh, it's just stories that sort of raise all the big questions. Yeah. That's where I want us to be. That's cool. And Lin- and yeah, and Lindsay was someone that, yeah, I, I sort of, I really liked her writing. Yeah. She's, Am I allowed to curse on this? T- on, yeah, on this? of course. She is fucking fast. Too. Yeah, she's she really ran fast. A, she ran a two fifty seven uh, marathon in, at CIM in December, uh-huh. and she's she's trying to qualify for the Olympic trials, um, which is a pretty huge endeavor to go from two fifty seven down to two forty five. But she's she's working at it. Yeah, good uh, for her. So, um, and yeah, she's. Uh, Super talented. Yeah, so she broke this story for people that are listening that aren't familiar um, about how, I mean, you can say it better than I can, but essentially how Nike um, was not uh, providing paid, essentially leave for their athletes on their roster who became pregnant. It was, it's almost kind of worse than that um, because... You know, it's common in the shoe industry, unfortunately, to have these reduction clauses. Mm -hmm. And what they would tell you is, uh, well, we need them because if we don't have incentives for runners to keep running, then they're just going to sign these contracts and we're going to have to pay them and then they're going to get injured and then they're not going to want to come back and they're just going to collect our money. So we need need them to keep performing at a certain standard and a certain level in the same way that, you know, if you played for, excuse me, if you played for the New York Yankees and, you know, if you weren't 
playing well, you'd get cut. Uh-huh. Now you'd probably you'd have a guaranteed contract uh, if you're in baseball, but in football, there's no guaranteed contracts. You get cut, you start getting paid anymore. So they're saying, you know, it's it, they would say it's not different from that. However, those contracts they really even at the highest level, you know, like even Meb after he won the 2009 New York Marathon, if he had gotten hurt and had to sit out for nine months, mm-hmm. they would, you know, cut his pay drastically. Um, and to get back to talking about the women, pregnancy was sort of seen put in the same bucket as injury. Right. Or disability. I mean, and actually even in our healthcare system today, I think when you go on maternity leave after your pregnancy, you go on disability, which is a strange categorization yeah, for it, yeah. but that's, that's, like a that's the way, right. But that's sort of the, that's how the healthcare system actually deals with it. Um, or at least it was when my wife was having her maternity leaves. Uh, and so they were equate, like I said, they were equating pregnancy with injury, uh, which is about as big a disincentive yeah. as you can get. And it's really unfortunate. It's a real challenge for female athletes who a lot of them are sort of, you know, reaching their um, their athletic primes as their biological clocks are ticking pretty mm-hmm. loudly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a great idea. Plenty of people have children and flourishing families after the age of, let's say, 35, which is when you see a lot of women retire from professional athletes. I don't think you would find a lot of OBGYNs to say, that's a great time to think about starting to have a family. My sense, just from a 10,000 foot view on this story is that, well, first of all, there's so many there's there's been so many developments in terms of nutrition and training technology and money being funneled into the sport that is promoting the longevity of these careers allowing athletes females and males to compete at the highest level later and later and later so there was a time not too long ago where the idea that you would be you know world class after age 25 just seemed impossible but we now know that's no longer the case. So I had this thought like, well, this contractual provision in these Nike contracts or in probably, by the way, these probably were, other you know, apparel contracts or whatever. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, these, but those contracts also had non-disclosure agreements okay, in them. So, so right. not only were they in there, but the runners, you know, Nike had protected itself because the runners weren't allowed to talk, to talk about, about them about because it. if they talked about it publicly, then... I don't know, you're the lawyer. Right. What's the, you know, if you sign a contract and you're not supposed to talk about it and you talk about it public, publicly. Well, you're you open could, to damages. Yeah, yeah. It's not good. Yeah, right. It's not a good thing. Yeah, so they could, do that. So it took, so, you know, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but uh, that was the thing where right. Lindsay had gotten these She'd women to, to talk about. That. Yeah. yeah. Which I, I can't imagine how she was able to, you know, get them comfortable enough to take that risk. It's being a reporter. It's right. being a good, yeah, being yeah, a yeah. really good journalist. But back to my thought, I mean, I, th- I I had this sense that this is probably antiquated language that's been in these contracts for a very long time. They were drafted initially when things were very different. And it's just one of those things where, well, this is the way we do it. And the general counsel's office or whoever drafted that just never really went back and looked at, like, should we really still be doing this? Until it finally got called out. And from a revenue perspective, Had Nike or whoever else was doing this gotten out in front of it before any of this happened and said, why are we doing this? This is crazy. We need to support our women um, during pregnancy. We believe in in them for the long haul. Uh, From a revenue perspective, it's really not that much money. And the storytelling and the goodwill that they could engender by demonstrating that kind of support for the athletes on their roster would have benefited them in such a dramatic way, but now they can't do it. Like now, it just it will seem well. They did it opportunistic. I mean, yeah. yeah, they have to do they, it. They did it. I mean, but they they're said, not, it's not going to make anyone feel good about that. Right? They did it. At, yeah. You know, they announced it on a Friday right. afternoon well, at have, five o'clock. Right? Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was sort of you know. Uh-huh. I mean, so in that sense, 
it's great that it's different, but nobody's patting them on the back. Of course. For doing that. But, you know, this is... And they're this, taking a huge hit. Yeah, but this is the... Right, and, and the, the amazing thing is the revenue perspective, because... I mean, we could. It's nothing. With three keystrokes, we could, you know, see what Nike's annual revenues yeah. were last year. You know, many, many billions of dollars, and to track what they what they spend on women's running and the oh, handful it, of women's I mean, running is like yeah. a fr- is the a, a, a tiny fraction of LeBron James's contract. Right. So we're not talking about a lot of, a, a lot of money there. Um, but you know, this is sort of the history of sports, of, of, of sports and sports business. And that was my, you know, my first your other book. Right, yeah. my first book was how sports became a business. And it was it was because it was athletes. It was not a bunch of you know white guys in suits, you know, coming up with great revelations about free agency and free markets and competition and things like that. It was a bunch of athletes rising up. And saying we're not going to be exploited anymore. And you know what? You mm-hmm. want to exploit professional athletes? Fine, go find them. We're not going to play. Right. And then you know, owners, commissioners, general counsels, whatever, they realize very quickly that ooh, you know, if we don't have the best in the world playing for us, we don't really have a business anymore. And nobody's buying mm-hmm. nobody's buying tickets to the Yankees to see George Steinbrenner play. They're buying tickets to the Yankees to see Aaron Judge or Derek yeah. Jeter play. So this is what it takes. It takes, you know, basically these athletes rising up and saying, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to deal with this anymore and embarrassing them and shaming people into not exploiting their labor. Yeah. Well, I think we're at another event horizon with this right now that we're, it, it seems like, it, it, you know, in the NBA and the NFL with, Players getting together and and in a way that you know is pretty powerful. I think. I think we're going to see some more changes. Yeah, and certainly from the uh, from the social standpoint, the political social standpoint, I think it's yeah. it's very clear that um, yeah, they they pl- athletes have voices and they have now to be more al- than ever, right? And they have to be allowed to. Uh, express those voices. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's really important to, and when they, when they try and suppress them, it does not go mm-hmm. well. Right. Uh, also, was it the New York times that, that, that broke this story about the NBA players who are experiencing depression because of social media and all the pressures that come with trying to, you know, basically have that voice. Yeah, You're familiar that, with the story, right? Yeah. I can't remember mm-hmm. who reported that. Um, I don't know who reported it first. It's it's been, you know, I, w- when you talk about, uh, I mean, this whole idea of athletes and depression, um, and there's multiple causes for it. I don't think it's just necessarily the social media yeah. and having a voice. Um, but I, I do know that uh, at, you know, at Stanford, for instance, they recently, I think they recently hired a, um, a psychologist for just the athletic department uh-huh. um, oh, from, wow. from the counseling center. And uh, I had heard that that person was like immediately completely overrun with- wow. Um, you know, just it did not have enough time in her day to, or his day. I'm not sure who it to was. Treat all of these to athletes. treat all of these athletes, and it's just a, it's a tremendous amount of pressure um, at the high level. And I would put Stanford athletics at a pretty high level of performance, in addition to you know the academic pressures that are there. But um, and these, you know, it, it sounds cheesy to say like they're they're people just like us. But uh, the frailties, uh, you know, the, the human frailties are not exclusive to, uh, you know, journalists and lawyers right. and teachers and things like that. The, the women who play on the women's national soccer team, they suffer from imposter syndrome. They're worried when they yeah. step onto the practice field that the coach is going to figure out that they're a farce, that they've been faking it all along. And this is the day they're going to be exposed yeah. as... Uh, not of, as not being good enough, not being fast enough. I mean, that's 
that's as common at the highest levels yeah. of sport as it is in any other walk of life. And then imagine a top draft pick for the NBA, some young kid who comes into a ridiculous amount of money, is put into the spotlight in a in a in a you know in a way that's hard to comprehend and has the added pressure not only of having to perform week after week to keep the job and maintain his position on the roster, but also develop his like quote unquote brand yeah. via social media because now everybody has to be their own brand and the responsibility that comes with that on top of just being an athlete. And it's not surprising that we're seeing all kinds of psychological crises that you know, we're having to confront with these And by the people. way, shoot uh, shoot forty three percent from three point land. Right. Or else right. You know, or else you're or else you're night done. after this night after point. night. Night after night, you know, you know hit nothing but net from right. twenty five feet, uh, with the clock running out. Mm. Yeah, it's not easy. I had a, a, a uh a girlfriend from college who uh and things did not end so well. I, you know, a few years ago, I was in contact with her, and I said I sort of apologized for uh, acting like an idiot. And uh, and she said, "Oh, please! If we were all held responsible for our twenty our twenty year old selves, we'd be completely screwed." <laughs> and it was honestly like one of the n- most generous things somebody yeah, has ever said. Kind. And. You know, it's a nice, it's a nice way. It's an, it, it's a nice way to think about like your acquaintances and things like that, or people who were, you know, jerks at one point. You, know, you get older, things are not that big a deal. But at the same time, you know, as a sports writer who has spent a lot of time with elite athletes in their twenties who have, you know, maybe not behaved great, I just imagine what it must be like. You know, we are holding them responsible for their twenty-year-old yeah. selves. I think we're we're holding almost everybody responsible now for their behavior all the time. And if you're a twenty-something, everything is now filmed and documented and shared. And we're in a culture that's hypersensitive that is holding people to account for things they did, you know, long in the past. And that concerns me. You know, I think we need to be able to be. Um, forgiving of people and allow them the place to the space to to grow and evolve and when we can't do that i think we're you know creating a a culture of fear that is making people you know uh afraid to connect with other human beings among other things i'm just glad i'm not i'm I'm just i'm just i'm just glad i wasn't on film when i was 24 years old trust me yes (laughs) (laughs) preaching to the converted yeah yeah so um what uh one thing i want to talk to you about is your thoughts on the the sub two hour kipchoge thing like how what do you think about that whole um, that pro- that Nike project where you know at Monza they tried to go under two hours and how close he's now become you know getting to that point and you know how long do you think it's going to be before that actually happens? Uh, well, I mean, I absolutely worship Kipchoge, yeah. of course. You know, it's, did it's you go astounding. to Monza? Were you there? I did not go to Monza. Yeah. No, um, but Ed he, Caesar gave you a blurb for the book. Yeah, so, sure so I had read his book. Right, I, had, I, I have it. I've known Ed for a while and. Um, I loved his book, Two Hours, yeah. which was really, you know, had a lot of foresight because he he wrote the book a couple of years before right. before the Kipchoge made that attempt, and um, so I, I will I will say that going into that first event, I was sort of dismissive of it, but then it just looked so cool, and right. it was so great the way you had all these other elite marathoners supporting it and trying to make it happen, uh, you know, forming the cone around uh-huh. him to try and break the wind. And it, it was, it's complete, kind of fascinating. And, you know, he's going to, he has another, the British chemical company is sponsoring him to try and do it, try it, make another go at it. And, you know, if he does it, it won't go in the record books because it's not an official race, right? but it's still a completely unbelievable thing yeah. for him to pull off, uh, it's just absolutely incredible. And what's even more amazing is probably the fact that he's got the world record down to two hundred one thirty <laughs> in a regular in a, in a regular race in right. Berlin. Uh, and 
I don't, I don't really know how much longer it's going to be. I mean, can he, can he get there, you know, right course, right day, right training block? I'm not going to say no, even though, you know, if you do the math and he still has to go 90 seconds faster and, you know, 90 seconds over 26 miles, you say, oh, well, it's just, you know, four seconds a mile or a little less than four yeah, seconds a mile. When you're talking that? about like but running at the edge. Right, but when you're, you're, you're running- already running at the edge, another four right, seconds every mile. Right, but he's mile. running 440, he's running 440 miles. You're telling, and now yeah. he's got to run 436s? I mean, that's it's completely yeah. insane. So- Everybody's seen those videos of the treadmill that they set up at the at the, at the the run expos where you have to jump on mm-hmm. and run his pace. Yeah, you know, it's impossible. Impo- right. People can't do it for more than five seconds. Right, it's completely <laughs> impossible. Yeah. Right, it's a good way, it's a good way to uh-huh. break your neck yeah. at getting one of those treadmills. So, uh, but I love anything that gets people fascinated with right. running, movement, activity. It's, it's like I said, it's, it's like the most elemental of sports in some ways. Uh, I wanted and- to be, I was, I wanted to be cynical and snarky about that whole thing. And then I started watching it and I was like captivated. I was like, I similar to what you said, I was like, oh no, this is actually really cool. Like, yeah, it's a stunt and all of that and it's a branding thing. And but at the same time, I couldn't help but just be riveted and amazed. And it's, I think he's gonna do it. I think he will. It's I'm not gonna say he yeah. won't, but I mean it's what does he run? He's won I think ten of his eleven marathons that he's run. Right. That that's probably more amazing than even breaking two hours. I mean, you just that just doesn't happen. And marathons are like golf tournaments. You know, Tiger Woods at his at his best, I think, was winning one out of three that he entered, which was an unheard of right. rate of success. And marathons, you know, if you win three or four in your entire career, you're right. in the Hall of Fame. And this guy's won 10 out of 11 of the fastest marathons. He's winning Berlin and London every year. He seems like such a gentleman too. And he's a gentleman. Yeah. And he's kind of like a Zen. He's kind of like very Zen about things. Uh He's really supportive. He's never, there's never been a whiff of, uh, of, of drug stuff around him. Um, So, so when you completely superhuman, when you look at him, how do you account for why he's so great or so much better? Or perhaps why does, why would, have you asked Larson what, what he, why he thinks Kipchoge is the best? Well, I I think most people, I mean, you start with how he lives and how he works, which is- He adheres to the three- He adheres to those three principles and he, you know, lives in the Rift Valley and trains with his group and- trains as hard as anybody. So there's that. And, uh, you know, he's blessed with this unbelievably efficient motor. Some people are born, you know, Mm -hmm. some people are born with this unbelievable motor. And clearly he's the complete outlier. He's the outlier of outliers. Um, He's, you know, he seems to have the perfect body type. Right. It's, it's one of those things that like you could analyze his stride and say, see, it's the perfect stride, but it's also the perfect stride for the body that he has. I'm not sure, yeah. you know, you and I could do everything. We could we could spend hours looking at tape and imitating his stride. We're still not gonna It's run. not gonna matter. We're not gonna run. Yeah. We're not gonna break five minutes in a mile. Um, I'm not gonna break six minutes in a mile if I do that. So, but... Yeah, I don't, I don't, and that's one of the, that's one of the really cool things about running is people don't, in some ways, people still don't really know exactly what creates a superhuman like that. Yeah. Uh, is it, it was, but that's what makes sports magical. It can, in the best, yeah, Yeah. in the best of circumstances. Absolutely. So in the process of researching and writing this book, how has it affected your own relationship with running? Like, has it changed how you train or think about your relationship to the sport? Well, I definitely PR'd while I was running. Yeah, while I was writing it in right? 2017, yeah. which was great. Uh, you run with a group? 
I wish I ran with a group more. I do occasionally <laughs> run with it. I do. I, uh, I, yeah, it's one of the things like I really have to get with because, yeah. you know, sometimes in New York Times, there's a little running team that I run with sometimes. Um, sometimes I run, I'll run with a friend uh, and, you know, but busy schedules, stuff like that. Uh-huh. Um, children, schools, dinners, things like that. Sometimes, you know, I can't always... Yeah. I can't necessarily. Is there a shower at your office? Can, there, you, can you duck out and? Uh, there is no shower at my office. I belong to a gym not far away, so I could. But I'm I'm an early morning. You go runner. Yeah, yeah, I go early morning, so uh, it's the start of my day. So that's that's not a problem. But it's just the. But although a lot of running groups actually in the city meet in the evenings, um, and that just like doesn't work so much for me. But there are right. early morning running groups. Uh, that I could get with. The nice thing about running is if you run, you meet one other person and you run with them, like that's your group. Yeah. You should run with Lindsay. Yes. I would love, I, I, well, she's on the team that uh, we run together sometimes uh-huh. in races. So that's pretty cool. And have you, do you work with a coach at all or do you create your own training program? You know, I interview so many coaches. <laughs> I'm sort of constantly trying other things, pick, picking up stuff. That's uh-huh. one of the things I love about my job is, uh, I'll do a story and, you know, I'll be in Flagstaff for a couple of days hanging out with, you know, the Hoka runners and I'll do one of the, you know, and they'll come back with, you know, a notebook filled with Ben Rosario's workouts. Yeah. And so I'll do those for a month or so. Uh, or, you know, I'll, I'll have one of my, you know, endless conversations, series of endless conversations with Bob and he'll say, or oh, here's one you could try. How about yeah. doing this? And so I'll do that. Just have him while. coach you. Right. Well, he basically does. He, he does. just doesn't realize it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So it's in that sense, it's fun make, bringing myself open to, it's made me, it's made me aware of all kinds of different training. So that's part of it. Uh, I will, <laughs> it has recently, I feel like it's brought a certain, a, a little more pressure than I would like to my running. You know, I came out with this running book and all now of a sudden- Now everyone's well, eyes on you. Yeah, well now it's sort of, I sort of almost feel like there's this pressure to be, for me to be like this running guy. Yeah, uh, we could, we could uh, I can relate to you that. You can we relate can, to that, We could that, have a right. conversation about that. Yeah, and I'm not even on the cover of my book. So, <laughs> so, it's, so there is that, there is a little bit of sense of, is this a job? Am I, is this not a job that I do or am I still doing it for my right reasons or, and I am still doing it because I love to do it, but there are, it's a, it's a weird thought process that I've never had because I've never written a running book before. Right. Um, how do you account for this explosion in interest in ultra, ultra running and the ultra endurance sports that we're seeing like this, this was, you know, talk about another fringe, movement that has really kind of tipped into the mainstream. It's interesting to see uh, these races go from, you know, a dozen people in tents, you know, the night before a race to selling out and creating all this kind of, you know, interest. I think it's, I think it's, it seems completely natural to me that, I don't know that it's necessarily people wanting to one up each other as much as they want to sort of one up themselves what's the next thing yeah what's the next thing i can do and then they hear about something and yeah i'd like to try that um also i think part of it has to do with uh you know the the, we're talking about a somewhat rarefied socioeconomic set when we're when you're in that group yeah um there's a fair amount of disposable income available to people uh, and that seems like a, a cool way to, a cool way to do it. Uh, I think social media has some element of it, you know, now, Mm -hmm. now there's the, you know, there's the ultra you did, but it doesn't actually exist until you post about it. Right. And then you, and then it exists. Yeah. So I think people want to, you know, people, people, are really into into that part, that self promotion aspect yeah. to it, and uh, you know, there is a certain group of people for whom there's a limit to how much enjoyment they can get from 
their mobile device or mm -hmm. their computer and uh you know who just want to get out and push themselves and do things that are different yeah. and um you know the picture and the and who wouldn't want to to me it's like who wouldn't want to i haven't done it yeah, yet i'm curious i haven't why done you it haven't. yet I mean, you've done 23 but marathons who, but like why, why no 50k or 50 mile or or a trail you know something else i think it's because um for some reason i've fallen into this i've fallen down this rabbit hole of like of numbers and speed and distance right. and first it was like qualifying for boss and then wow let's see if i can still get but here's the thing See, yeah. this is from a very Bob Larson perspective. This is why you need to you need to shake it up. Like you need to get off like what he would call the track. Like yeah. if you get off that, you're so wed to these numbers and holding yourself to account for these performance goals, you might actually be able to crash through this plateau by um, by you know doing something completely different that's longer, where it's not about numbers and then return to the marathon in a year or two or whatever with a refreshed perspective on it. And I would, I would venture to bet that you would see a big performance gain. I think you're right. And I'd like to try it. And I, I just, and it's like, it's, the, it's one of the, it's probably the thing that lately, um, and a, and a a bunch of like friends that I know who do them and keep asking me about it as well. Wow. It's lately become the thing that A, I'm afraid of, B, I'm starting to think about a little too much, C, when I'm afraid of something and I'm thinking about it a lot, I know I'm going to have to try it right. at some point. So you're gonna it's have to become- get, You're going to have to get comfortable with that discomfort. Right. So I'm going to be- so. It's, there is, and is 50K, you think, a good distance to start yeah, out I would, with? I would, I would, I would urge you to go, like, find a trail race. You know, just do something totally different. Well, I really want to do a trail know? marathon. Yeah. There's one outside Chicago. But to forget about the right. marathon. Like, do something where you can't, it's just so apples and oranges. Yeah. That it gets you out of that paradigm that you're in. Uh Okay, let's do it. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm ready. You commit. I'm ready for it. You're committing right here. I gotta, I'll right? do it. All right. That's it's fine. on the record. It's on the record. I'm fine. I'll do I'll to do it. I'll do a you. trail run. Have you have you ever um, covered the thirty one hundred? Do you know the Sri Shinmoy run in Queens? Uh, I know about it, but I think it's I have about not... to start. I think it starts in June. It might have might have already started. I don't know. Right. I know about I've seen mm -hmm. pictures of them doing it, so no, I've never I've never covered you should just, that. It just go out there and check it out. I had Sanjay Rawal on who made a documentary called 3100 Run and Become that I think you would enjoy. And it follows a couple different people. Um, but in particular, one guy who's like, I think he's from Finland. I can't remember, but he's like a mailman. And he does this race every year. And they literally run around this one mile block in Queens until they've reached 3100. It's like the course is open from 6 a.m. to midnight every day. They run as much as they can every day. They go to sleep, they come back the next day right. and they just keep doing it. And there's just something so bananas and fascinating and beautiful and insane about the whole thing. Yes, that is the ultra that I definitely will not be yeah, doing. I, I can tell I'm you that, do that either. <laughs> But maybe just take a subway ride out there yes. and watch for an afternoon. Right. You know? I, yeah, that's 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 that one I would like to do. a good story for the New York Times, too. Right. If you guys haven't, I'm sure you've covered that race in the past, the, the paper. Hunts. Yes, we definitely have. Yeah. I will say the one thing about trail running that does make me nervous is I would, a, a, a one of your college classmates, Peter Graff, mm. um, oh, yeah, last, Peter. last year, uh, I mean, it was 2017, I was out in Boulder and I'd never been on the Mesa Trail and I wanted to run on the Mesa Trail and Peter's kind of an insane trail runner. And I was I like, didn't know yeah, that. I was like, yeah, I got to, uh, I, I, I got to, you know, an interview at 10. So I'm, you know, or 1030, I'll meet you. I'll come by your house. At, at, he's like, sure, come by in the morning. We'll go. Uh -huh. And like two hours and 15 minutes later, you know, where I'm stumbling <laughs> down the Mesa Trail with uh -huh. Peter and he's, I, I, I was, I mean, I was tired, yes, but the main thing I was afraid of was losing my front teeth. Uh -huh. uh, so that's part of the fear of the trail run is the tripping over the roots and the 
rocks. But you're and working stuff like that. different muscles. Yep. It's a different discipline. You're shaking it up, and it's making you stronger in areas that don't get worked. Just running the loop in Central Park, absolutely. And you're not looking at your Garmin, worried about your pace because it doesn't matter. Right. It's completely. Yeah. It's completely separate from it. No, I totally. I. I I'm totally with it intellectually. The one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to carry my water. Uh-huh. I don't want to. I don't like that whole self-supporting idea and the back <laughs> and the backpack. I have no Why? interest from in. an aesthetic point of view, or uh, just honestly from a uh, a sort of flow point of view. Uh-huh. Like I, I'm part of the reason I love running is I love the sort of feeling of being liberated and unencumbered, and the idea of having a pack on my back and running seems unpleasant. Yeah, but you could just do the little waist strap with the one bottle or something like that. You'll get used to it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're going to acclimate to it. All right, let's um, do it. Cool. Well, I want to close this down with one one final thing, which is um, your thoughts on running culture. Like the book is about the rebelliousness, the kind of rock and roll you know, sensibility that accompanied this you know, burst, this... Um, this uh, you know, new kind of revelation that took place as a result of Larson's work. Um, how do you think about running culture now? Like, is it still, you know, Knox Robinson said, you know, running is an act of rebellion. I've heard you say something similar. Like, is that still the case? Like, how do we connect with that rebelliousness now when it is such a mainstream, you know, Lululemon type of activity? I think the biggest evolution that running has undergone, certainly in the last 15, 20 years, is that it has really gone from being a solitary activity to a group of, a group activity. When I'm running in Central Park, uh, there were plenty of runners in the 90s in Central Park, but now there are just these clumps. You just, everybody is running seemingly with a group and not everybody, but a lot of people. And you just keep passing these clumps and everybody's talking to each other. And it's it's a really social thing. And I think that's terrific because mm-hmm. I know the performance benefits of it. And I know that if you're making plans to run Thursday, you're a lot more likely to skip it if you don't have to meet someone on the corner of 81st and 3rd at 6 in the morning. Yeah. So... Um, so that's the sort of that that is sort of where running culture is right now. And yes, it's mainstream, but I, I do continue to think that even though there's hundreds of thousands of people who line up on the start lines of marathons every year, that's still a pretty small fraction of the population. And most people When you say to them, yeah, I'm running New York next Saturday or I'm running Boston in a month, most people say, wow, that's amazing. You're crazy. And that's a real kick for me. I know Mm -hmm. it is. And I think it's a real kick for a lot of people that, 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 that idea that this is still, yes, it's mainstream, but it's to a lot of people, it's still a little, it's a little nuts and um, it still feels a little rebellious. Uh, it still feels like you're sort of, I don't know if you, I don't know, cheating is the wrong word, but you're doing something, you're doing something different. That's one of the reasons the Boston Marathon is so great because it takes place on a Monday uh-huh. and the entire rest of the world is at work. Working, I know. And this is Monday morning and all of Boston is, is off for the day. Essentially, you know, yes, it's Patriots Day, but what is Patriots Day even? Um, Essentially, it's Marathon Day. Uh And it just feels like you're playing hooky from life. And dialing into that sort of playing hooky from life thing on a daily run is something that's still possible and still certainly brings me a great deal of joy. And I think brings a lot of people a lot of joy. Yeah. I think it's freedom. It's sort of railing against uh, the gestalt of time and gravity. There's something about it that is uniquely liberating that I don't feel when I'm riding a bike. I mean, riding a bike is amazing for different reasons and swimming as well, but there's something specific about running that I don't get or find in either 
other endurance pursuits um, that I can't quite put my finger on. But it does feel nonetheless like an act of rebellion for some strange reason, even though everyone's doing it. Or not everyone, but a lot of people. And not having the answer is probably the best thing. Right. I think if you if you are too articulate about the answer, you haven't thought deeply enough about it, maybe. Right, and then you'll end up stopping. Right. Because the search will be over. <laughs> That's right. And who wants that? Yeah, nobody wants that. I want to run as long as I possibly can. Basically. So thank you. That was fantastic. Thanks so much really for having it. me. Um, Running to the Edge is the book. Congratulations, you were named by Time Magazine, like one of the the the, the reads you got to read this summer. One That's of the cool. one of the thirty two must reads for this 32. summer. Who which reads thirty two books who, exactly, for summer? <laughs> exactly. How is that? How as is I that recall, even? though, as I was scrolling through it, I think it was pretty high in the list. I don't know if they ranked them in any particular order, but uh, it showed I, up pretty soon. Yeah, I'm not supposed to mention this. I should say, Number like, two. it comes out at the beginning of the uh-huh. summer, and in with the it was like by release date and alphabetical so that's what i think put me uh, ahead of elizabeth we'll gilbert say, yeah. but it's so <laughs> but i think i was fourth on the right. list and uh amy was very pleased with that all right cool so what did we learn here a couple things one you're going to sign up for some trail 50k uh i need to run with groups more i'm such a solo guy so that's actually a change that i'm going to make as a result of talking to you and reading this book and third next time i'm in new york let's go running Absolutely. Deal? Absolutely. All and right. I'm going to keep up all this running and adventure coverage in the New York Times. Yeah. And keep pleasing Good. people yeah, like please, you. Please continue to expand that. It's been great to be able to um, read more and more about these more obscure athletes and the fact that you're introducing them you know, in the grandest way possible to the world is a, is a really cool thing. So I commend you for that. Thanks. All right, man. Until Thanks so much time. for having me here. All right, Matthew. Peace. Let's.